Hi, uh, we are recording this video podcast with health protocol in place. My name is Windy Arini. I'm a program officer at Rao Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law Regional Asia Pacific Program. Our video podcast will focus on uh, research finding on localizing human rights in the context of SDGs and promoting the importance of public participation in local governance. Here with us today is our next uh, resource person or uh, partner, uh, Dr. Sylvia Yazid from the University of Parahyangan, Bandung, Indonesia. Uh, please tell me a little bit about yourself first and then your role in this research. Okay. Um, my name is Sylvia Yazid. I'm currently an associate professor at the International Relations Department of Parahyangan Catholic University. Our institution is the cooperation partner for this research project. And I am the leader of the team. My team include two other lecturers, uh, Mirei Marcia Karman and Rizky Widian. And we are also assisted by two students, Tiffany Angelica and Salsabila Dwi Putri Perbatas. Great. Um, let's discuss uh, the first question. Uh, so this research is focusing on uh, localizing human rights in the context of SDGs, with particular emphasis on gender equality and the environment. Uh, which later uh, served as the backbone of the handbook on localizing human rights uh, that we work together with other partners as well. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your research? Okay, so we decided to focus on the localizing efforts um, which are conducted through a local development planning process while acknowledging the importance of the bottom-up approach and based on our previous research, we believe that for the case of Indonesia, particularly Bandung, an analysis on localizing uh, uh, the human rights in the context of um, SDGs should involve an understanding of how the initiatives exist within the local governing mechanism. Therefore, we focus on the so-called Musrenbang, Musyawarah Perencanaan Pembangunan. It is actually a multi-stakeholder consultation forum for development planning because through the setting of development priorities, we can observe whether human rights and SDGs have become parts of the process and have become the basis in setting the priorities. Um, we tried to identify who were involved, are women there? Were they active, for example? What development issues were discussed, um, including whether gender and environment issues were discussed or not? And how the process was conducted? Um, does the process allow ample time for deliberation, for example? These are the aspects that we believe are crucial to ensure the inclusiveness of the development planning process which is central to the localization efforts. Great, um, but Sylvia, um, for those of us who may or may not be uh, too familiar with, with Musremba, can you just briefly mention uh, how does it set up, set up and then how it rolled out? Yeah, um, actually Musremba is a um, multi-level, step-by-step um, -step development planning process. It starts um, at the really at the grassroots with um, people getting together and then each result will be brought to the next level, to the next level, to, and to the next level until it reached the national level. And um, by doing that, it is hoped that um, the voice from the grassroots will really um, be uh, accommodated um, at the planning, uh, within the planning process. That sounds very promising practices, actually, Mbak, Patri uh, Mbak Sylvia. And we will discuss a little bit more about participation in the next questions. But just a follow up about uh, the research findings itself. Um, through your research, how do you think human rights and SDGs uh, link at the local level, especially in Bandung in this case? Well, uh, unfortunately, in practice, they tend to be treated as two separated entities. That's what we observe, particularly yeah. if we are talking about reporting. So they will be reported uh, as two separate reports. And there are two okay. separate, there are usually two separate reports uh, prepared for them. While in fact, 
SDGs were formulated in accordance with human rights principles, right? Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So more specifically, it deals with implementation of human rights principles to answer today's challenges such as poverty, mm. environmental degradation, gender equality, diseases, you name it. There are many um, of those kind of issues. Since SDGs have been ratified by many countries, including Indonesia, the implementation of SDGs in local communities have become um, the government's priorities. So the localization of SDGs at the local level is believed to be the main force to increase the quality of human rights fulfillment for the people, mm. since realizing SDGs equals to realizing human rights principles, basically. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. Moreover, in some countries where human rights is often met with suspicion by local people and government for its um, relations with Western culture or against local wisdom. Localization of SDGs becomes a more acceptable norm and terminology because it deals with more concrete or tangible practices on the ground. So I can say that SDGs should be used as um, a way to put human rights forward. So that's what I think so far. Okay, that's an interesting fact, actually. And just related to the more, um, you know, your experience or your uh, knowledge captured in this research, um, in your opinion, uh, what do you think, why do you think uh, local government should focus on uh, localizing human rights in the context of SDGs? Well, first and foremost, it is the local government's main duty to develop the city in a way that fits the needs of the city residents. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. Fulfilling human rights and SDGs make them closer to fulfilling such duties. At the same time, the local government is expected to translate the more global values and terms from human rights and SDGs to the local context. And in our previous research, we found that the local residents understood the essence of a number of human rights and SDGs, but they had no idea that what they understood was actually part of human rights and SDGs. As an, as an illustration, um, a local citizen stated that the terminologies in the human rights and SDGs are still foreign to them while they are actually doing it, where they are actually demanding it. Um, during the webinar that we con conducted in January 2021, we circulated a survey in order to obtain the citizens and public officials' understanding on human rights and SDGs. The result of the survey showed that there are different levels of understanding between the general citizen and the governments about human rights and SDGs. Thus, um, there is a need for a simplification or translation of these terminologies in order for the people to understand okay. human rights and SDGs. This also indicates that the local government still needs to create more inclusive um, human rights fulfillment programs. Moreover, the head of the city planning agency um, stated that although there is an understanding of human rights among the citizens, the local government still needs to improve the human rights literacy level of mm. both the citizens and the local government officials. Okay, Sylvia, uh, let's go a, a little bit deeper to the, the research itself. Well, part of your research is uh, the ex about the existence of legal framework on human rights and SDGs at the national and city levels. Uh, how do you see this practice uh, could could support uh, the efforts in localizing human rights in the context of SDGs? Well, we found that the existence of a legal framework is essential to ensure the government's commitment to fulfill the human rights obligation. Um, moreover, it also makes it easier for the local civil society to monitor and evaluate the government's efforts to fulfill human rights obligation because, you know, like there is some basis to it. And our findings showed that compared to a mere political commitment, um, such as a declaration, legal frameworks on human rights at the city level have more impact and are more readily acknowledged by both the society and the government. In our case study, for example, we also found that um, a top-down legal framework 
from national level government to the city level government tends to be followed closely by the local government because they tend to think that there is, it is a clear obligation while a bottom up initiative without any legal sting is optional to be followed. This national legal framework then needs to be translated into a local one to serve the local context and needs. So to ensure that this um, process still um, accommodate the voice from uh, the, the grassroots, um, more stakeholders need to be involved in the, the translation process to the local um, legal framework. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that that uh, legal framework may then uh, make the effort also, as I understand it, more sustainable. Yes. Because um, we also understand that, you know, in, in especially in, in, in city context, uh, leadership changes. Yes. And uh, how do you think uh, the change of leadership uh, that does that affect uh, the process of localizing human rights or uh, so long as there's a legal framework exists, it should be um, it should be sustainable enough? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, with within our conversation with the um, local governments, whether it was in Bandung or in other forum that we attended, and even when we attended an international um, uh, forum like uh, the World Human Rights City Forum, um, the word leadership always come up, and and it come up as um, a potential factor. To, to put this effort forward, but it also came up as a concern that when, le when leadership change, there's a possibility that this effort might be put aside. Exactly, so yeah. So one, one of the strategy um, made by uh, another uh, human rights city in Indonesia was um, to as soon as possible when 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 you know like when the hype is there is to to secure a local uh, legal framework um, um, so whenever the leader move on to another position this legal framework uh, can guarantee the sustainability of this effort so that's what they suggested yeah, that's that's uh that's also uh, an interesting factor, isn't it? Like to to create a more sustainable um, mechanism, not just the legal framework itself, but also in some other cases, like uh, in in other cities in Indonesia, they even uh, develop a task force on on human rights, or like the Guangzhou case, they have an office on on human rights and democracy. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think that's exactly. that's also that's an, yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the, the discussion usually. Do we need a specific office for human rights or not? Do we need uh, to explicitly use the word human rights or not? So those kind of, um, you know, um, searching mechanism of the right formula, the right um, uh, mechanism for, for this localization process. But we believe that it really depends on the context, the local context. Yeah, it is. It is really uh, depending on on the context. Uh, however, as we understand it, um, as you mentioned also earlier, that states do have uh, uh, responsibilities on on human rights that they have to fulfill. And um, I just just uh, uh, just one just one question uh, leading towards more uh, about about the participation of, of uh, public in, in, in the cities. Um, from your research, yeah. um, you explain quite extensively on public participation in local governance and using different models um, yeah. uh, thus far uh, in, in Bandung, for example. Uh, can you briefly elaborate on that? Yep. Yes, so um, we found that in Bandung, the Musrembang, uh, the multi-stakeholder consultation forum for development planning, uh, has a potential to increase a public participation, particularly when we are talking about a densely populated area where you cannot invite everyone to do the planning, right? Uh, it can be considered as a way or mechanism to ensure an inclusive public participation within the city development planning and to some extent implementation. 
um, Musrembang is um, also legally regulated at the national and local level. And based on the regulations, the people are able to participate uh, in the formulation of the development uh, plan and also support the monitoring and evaluation process of the implementation of such plans. Um, public participation in Musrembang is a requirement and such participation has to fulfill the principle of representation of all elements within the society. The conduct of the Musrembang is a reflection, therefore, of participatory and dialogical um, deliberations by the government and the community. Because of this requirement that it needs to involve everyone, it needs to involve um, uh, all parts of the society. So it, the, the, the meeting cannot go on without that. So it is potential to, to um, be used as an inclusive process. Okay, you, you, you put uh, quite an emphasis on the word potential. Uh, do you think there's, there's still a room for, for improvement uh, in Musrenbang or other models that you found really? Well, the thing is, we always see implementation as a challenge, right? The mechanism is there, the requirement is there. It is, again, up to the people to actually implement it, how it was designed. So, yes, I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> okay, but so it, it's, it's quite subtle that you mentioned there is a room for improvement, of course. Uh, nothing is perfect. Um, but um, let's, let's discuss... Um, what do you think uh, a meaningful public participation should look like? Any model or you know practices uh, that you found uh, in the years that you've been working on this issue uh, that may be uh, the most promising or the most innovative? Yes, so uh, again, our case study is um, specific because we are talking about an area with big population. So uh, Bandung um, is a big uh, city uh, and the society is much varied. So in this context, um, a meaningful public particip participation should be reflected um, in a form of inclusive participation in local government decision-making process, especially concerning development where needs and interests are optimally represented. I'm, I'm not saying that all of them are, are, are accommodated, but optimally represented. So, um, yeah, the, dem the democratic condition and culture in Indonesia actually favors direct physical activities to participate in decision-making process, right? So, um, in such condition, um, citizen assembly uh, uh, is very much uh, appreciated. And Musrenbang is, um, it, it kind of represents that. There are people gathering, talking, expressing their thoughts, their responses to that. So that kind of interaction is very much appreciated. So um, Musrenbang is actually an annual forum for deliberation between stakeholders, which is carried out in stages, starting from the lowest political community meetings at the Rukun, we call it Rukun Warga, so it's actually just a neighborhood, something like that. And then it goes up to village or sub-district, district, regent or regency or city, and then up to the province and up to the national level. And within the forum, people can partake uh, in the formulation of the development plan and evaluation the last year's plan implementation. So there's this entry check. So it's not just asking them, what do you want? But then um, at the beginning, before asking what do you want, um, it's also asking, um, has the last year's one been fulfilled? Or should we um, discuss that again? So there is that me mechanism. And uh, the conduct of Musrenbang is a reflection of participatory and dialogical deliberations between the government and the community. Therefore, it is important to ensure that all stakeholders are represented and all needs and interests are expressed and accommodated. Not an easy task, of course. That's, that is why the dialogue is 
crucial. And when you asked me earlier about the room for improvement, um, you know that um, not everyone can, you know, initiate that kind of dialogue uh, immediately and come up with, you know, results. <laughs> it is, it is, uh, it is a challenge, uh, especially um, in a quite dense, densely populated areas, and then it is also uh, uh, a challenge in itself to have a good representation and what is the definition of good representation is it's also uh, differ. Um, yeah, yeah. And, from, and I think yeah. if I may add a little bit that um, um, some people might say that um, the challenge is that the people are not given the opportunity. But that's not always the case. Sometimes um, the people are given the opportunity. However, they might not be able to uh, um, make use of the opportunity because of several factors and education might be one of them or uh, ability to uh, publicly express what they want that might also be a problem so um, I would suggest that we don't see it as a one-way problem um, more holistic like um, everyone needs to contribute and everyone needs to prepare themselves to contribute contribute yeah. Just, just a one, one last follow up question about participation. You also mentioned in the earlier point that that uh, there is a gap in knowledge, both uh, from the government side as well as the as the public side about human rights and SDGs, and then how it links. We can then relate to to your just uh, just now you're you're pointing out um, maybe the people themselves uh, may not have uh, sort of sufficient knowledge or awareness on this issue. How do you then tackle this issue, or how do you suggest uh, the local governments or NGOs or uh, universities uh, can can address this issue to sort of empower the public uh, participation even more? I think it's constant improvement that that should be um, part of the strategy. Um, let's take uh, uh, this current pandemic situation as an example, for example. Um, um, everyone was caught off guard, of course, um, but and the Musrenbang activity has been slightly disrupted due to the inability to have a physical meeting. Like I said before, we, we really appreciate physical interaction right you know like we can see who we are talking to um, they are they are listening to us so it was immediately switched to um hybrid mode um not not online not full online but hybrid um then it requires additional infrastructure such as computer and internet connection uh, as well as additional skill which is digital capability including how to moderate a discussion in a hybrid mode that's already challenging right so um they tried it so um it shows that the city quickly adapt to the situation by providing required infrastructure infrastructure so um bandung is quite um proud of the e musrenbang process online meeting facility but the quality of the infrastructure could be further improved of course so that no one is left behind by the rapid change um, um, it, uh, triggered by this pandemic situation. And more importantly, the residents' digital capacity needs to be improved as well. So that the use of the internet to replace the physical assembly does not create accidental exclusion for some of them. Instead, um, digitalization should be used to enhance um the level of inclusiveness because presumably the online assembly can provide more space right um we should see it we should see it like that and other than that we also see the current practice can have better conduct especially in terms of the quality of the discussion um we found that there were cases of you know, prolonged ceremonial introduction, absence of some key actors on both sides, whether the people or the, the local government, and also um, lack of feedback. So like something was expressed, but then there was no feedback to that. Um, and these problems may reduce the effectiveness of discussion and hence the quality of public participation. 
So how to overcome this? Um, I guess educating the people and the local government on what is considered or what is um, what should be uh, a, a, a productive dialogue in terms of uh, development planning. Okay, that was an interesting point that you mentioned earlier, Sylvia. I just want to um, uh, direct the discussion a little bit to, to the handbook itself that uh, this research is, is uh, supporting. Um, why and how do you think uh, this handbook could help or support uh, local governments, uh, particularly in addressing the different challenges that challenges that you mentioned earlier, uh, be it gender equality or COVID-19. And uh, as, as we are uh, getting up to COP26, um, climate change, how, how do you see this would be uh, supporting uh, local governments? Yeah, so we understand that this handbook is not and should not be a definitive guide or solution to solve the challenges posed by COVID-19 and climate change or whatever um, challenges that we are facing in the future. However, we believe that steps suggested in the book can assist local governments in ensuring that decision-making and development planning process are inclusive because they utilize the human rights-based approach. Um, through this handbook, we want to emphasize that it is not enough to put the rights of the people as the orientation of city development planning and policies or build activities and conduct activities that are assumed to be the needs of the people. We strongly suggest that such actions should be the result of the inclusion of the residents in the planning process not just putting them as the end goal. Um, by involving the people, they can have more say uh, in what they want and need for themselves and hence will better fulfill their rights. Um, at the same time, um, the suggested steps can be considered as ways to educate the public in terms of setting their development priorities. Um, in one of our conversations with the local government officers, um, it was stated that there were cases where the residents seems to demand what they want instead of what they need, what they actually need during the forum. Um, hence, it is also the government's responsibility um, to separate the needs from the wants and gradually trust the residents' ability to understand their own needs um, so they can separate them from their wants by themselves and discuss their own needs with the government as equals. So we believe this handbook can help in changing the mindset. Uh, it can help in initiating and scaling up the meaningful collaboration between local government and the public. And other than that, we also believe that this handbook can be a guide um, to strengthen the relations between the local government and the society. By doing so, the city will be better united in facing challenges such as the impact of pandemic or climate change, which require collective action rather than relying solely on government's action. It was uh, it was interesting, just a little bit, uh, the point that you mentioned uh, earlier that local governments and uh, the public should come uh, as equals, and I, I think that's a that's a that's an interesting point there. That yes, indeed, uh, uh, the government and the public needs to be um, at equal uh, in terms of uh, setting up. Uh, local priorities, for example. Just one last question. Um, is there any other uh, points from your research findings that you would like to highlight in the session? Yeah, I think we. Um, I've mentioned it a little bit at the beginning, but um, I would just uh, emphasize it again that 
um, our findings show that in the case of Bandung, and maybe this might be the case in other cities in the world too, that the localization of SDGs and human rights um, should be a mixture of top-down and bottom-up approach. That's what um, we believe so far. Um, the top-down initiatives lay the normative uh, foundation for human rights and SDGs norms. That's, that's how it works. And they also serve as the, the arbitrary power to ensure that the produced policies and programs uh, comply with ratified international norms. So it's like a bridge from the global level to the local level. While on the other end, um, the bottom-up initiatives through mechanisms like Musrembang, for example, serves as the deliberative arena where every person can participate or be represented in the decision-making process and rely, realize their political, social, and economic rights. So it's like meeting um, at the middle. Um, that's what we would like to put to the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Sylvia, for our discussion uh, today. It was very interesting points that you raised and uh, hopefully uh, the work that we do together uh, could benefit uh, not only local governments, but also local stakeholders in, in all of our cities. Thank you again, Sylvia. Have a good day.